Stanford University. Hello and welcome to the Stanford Seminar on People, Computers, and Design. Next week we have Carrie Karahelios coming out from the University of Illinois. She's going to talk about her work on social software and community software. And uh, it's, it's fantastic work and so especially for those of you who are in my social software class, I encourage you all to come. This week we have David Merrill uh, from, fresh from recently defending his PhD at the MIT Media Lab. David's going to talk about his dissertation work today. And I think one of the things that's incredible about David's dissertation work is that we've long had this dream that the, our physical world and our digital world could be more seamlessly integrated than they are today. The, the graphical user interface frames everything within, this, uh, within the screen. What if it broke out into the physical world? But creating interfaces that are uh, right in the physical world can often be quite difficult. And, what David's done is really realize an enormously compelling platform of these wirelessly networked shiftables, much like uh, I'm sure he's going to show a demo. But if you can imagine if this was interactive and could show pictures and could talk wirelessly with all of its other devices, in addition to all of the uh, engineering challenges of making this happen, there are a lot of wonderful interaction design questions that this new paradigm for interacting with computers raises. And so, uh, let's welcome David Merrill to the talk today. Thanks, David. Great. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> and it's really fun to be here because I've probably watched, you know, tens of lectures in the same room. I was a, an undergrad and a master's here at Stanford. Um, so I'm really happy to be here to share my work with you. Um, to begin, think back to when you were a kid and just learning how to navigate the world. Imagine when you were playing with blocks like this or Legos or some other toy. You learn very quickly to use your hands and reach out and grasp with your fingertips, move things around, find out what would stand up and what would fall down. And in doing so, you, got, you built a lot of skills about, uh, uh, that, that, are, that helped you interact with physical objects. But then, most of us make this transition at some point where we start to use computers. And even today, in 2008, our typical uh, inter interface to the computer is in this extremely narrow channel of 101 buttons and this mouse cursor, which gives us basically one fingertip to touch that information space, right? Which should be such a vast space, bigger, in fact, than our physical world, but one fingertip. Uh, and to think about why this is a problem, imagine yourself back with a pile of blocks and somebody tells you you can use one fingertip to build. Right? It would be so frustrating uh, and it, at first it would be difficult to do anything. And then eventually we'd learn how to cope and we'd get pretty good at using one fingertip to do what we needed to do, which is what we do with the graphical interface today. But still I think it's nowhere near as natural as using both hands and, and fingers to, to interact with, with uh, objects. So uh, this is an extremely oversimplified set of axes, uh, but it points out what I think is a common tension between physicality and generalizability. So on the one axis, we have physical objects like the pipe wrench, like other, other objects that, that build a lot of meaning or build a lot of information about the activity into the shape of the object itself. Right? It's extremely good at, 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 um, at pulling uh, nuts off of pipes, but it's not that good for many other things. However, then on the other side, uh, today's graphical user interfaces are extremely generalizable. Right? The screen with pixels gives us this ability to have this one tool that adapts to, to seemingly nearly anything. But the problem is that these tools don't yet take advantage of all these skills that we built throughout our life for interacting with physical objects. Um, so my question is, well, could we either move farther in the direction of generalizability from the physical tools, or could we move further in the direction of physicality from uh, information tools with screens. What would be in that spot? So to give you just a little bit of background, uh, I want to talk about this uh, theory of psychology distributed cognitions from the early 80s that basically says we use the objects in our world to think about problem solving. We can offload cognitive cycles onto the, the representation of the problem as encoded by the objects we're using. Uh, so here's a nice example. Uh, <clears throat> looked at, uh, Magdalene and Kirsch looked at Tetris players 
And they were looking at the number of rotations that the person would, would apply to a piece on average before dropping the piece into the, into the bottom. And what they found, which was a little counterintuitive, I think, was that players with greater amount of skill would tend to rotate the piece more times before dropping it into the bottom. And it's kind of weird because it seems like if you are good at Tetris, you should just see where the piece needs to go and put it there, right? It shouldn't, you shouldn't need to rotate it that many times. But what it suggests is that there's actually a, co a cost doing that rotation mentally. And it's easier to do it out there where you can see the result than it is to try to do it all in your head. Similar uh, study, a related study um, on Scrabble, um, people playing a, a simplified game of Scrabble, uh, they basically, what they found was that uh, the subjects that were allowed to rearrange the tiles with their hands found more words than those who had to basically sit on their hands and just look at the tiles to, and, and try to spot words. Right, so it helped them to be able to rearrange uh, the problem uh, to find the solution. One more uh, related study, Zhang and Norman were looking at people playing um, this classic Towers of Hanoi puzzle, which uh, those of us in computer science know really well. Um, and what they found was the, the representation of the problem, i.e. the type of objects that were used, made a big difference on how easy it was for people to solve the Towers of Hanoi problem. Right? So on the left, we have the typical discs on, on uh, pegs. In the middle, they had uh, uh, bowls with oranges, small, medium, and large size oranges. And you had to remember what the rules were, which, which could go into the, to the bucket based on the, other, the oranges that were in there. And that was really hard because it didn't encode the problem. But when they looked at a version that had teacups where you actually couldn't do the wrong thing, the, the, the physical shape of the objects actually enforced some of the constraints of the problem it made a big difference and it helped people solve the problem. So looking at the way we design user interfaces, the more we can uh, allow the, the problem to be rearranged easily by a user, the more we can encode the constraints of the problem in the tools themselves, we have an opportunity to help people prob uh, solve problems more effectively. Another idea, um, so back in the early days of computers, right, uh, you had to be very careful before you, sub before you ran a program because if your program had a bug, it, you had to go to the back of the queue and it might be half a day or a day before you got your program back in. So you had to check and double check and triple check that program to make sure it was good before, you'd feed it, before you would dare feed it in. But then today, of course, we've been moving in this direction of rapid prototyping where computation is cheap, it's easy to access computers. So it's often a better idea if you're writing software, for instance, to just try something. If you have an idea, try it out. See if it works rather than spending too much time trying to deliberate about whether that's going to work or not. It's cheap and it's easy to just try. Um, uh, there's a book, Milliseconds Matter, that also sh uh, discussed how even very, very small changes in the amount of time that it takes to accomplish a task uh, will dramatically impact the strategies people end up using with it. So making things fast and efficient is good. <laughs> so my motivating question is, <coughs> can computers leverage our physical world skills, but in a way that generalizes, right? I, I want to blend these two, um, these two things that are good. Physicality, because it leverages our skills. Generalizable, because it, uh, it, we can apply it to, any, to a large number of tasks. A little bit about me. I was an undergrad here at Stanford, studied symbolic systems. And uh, most of you probably know what that is. Um, but it, basically interested in cognition and computation, <laughs> how the two are, are similar or different. Uh, and I got interested in how do we collaborate with computers, human-computer interaction. How, do we, how can we become better activity partners with the machines that we use every day? And, uh, and so I followed that up with um, a master's also here at Stanford, worked with Terry Winograd in computer science. And um, as, I, <coughs> as I did more and more human-computer interaction work, I realized that it wasn't just our brains that needed to be able to interface the machines better, but also our bodies. And so I wanted to really uh, start to build systems that, uh, that gave our bodies, our hands, better ways to interface the machine. So I went to the Media Lab where I've spent the last six years and um, changed my tool set, you know, brought this computer science tool set to bear, but also started working with sensors, embedded processing, wireless communication. And uh, what I'm going to do now is show you three projects, two earlier projects, and then talk about my thesis work, which is building on this background of human-computer interaction uh, from Stanford, but, but bringing this new tool set to bear. So the first one is The Sound of Touch. This is a collaboration with <coughs> my friend Hayes Raffle. Um, and 
the motivating problem here was the disconnect between everything we know about sound versus the way we manipulate digital sounds on a computer. And if you think about your everyday life, there's so many sounds around you. A lot of them come from objects, right? Even before I touch the surface of this desk, I know pretty much what it's going to sound like if I knock it, if I scratch my fingers across it. Paper is different. Fabric is different. I have all this built-in knowledge about how things sound when I manipulate them. But then when I go to use a graphical user interface program on my computer to edit sound, most of that knowledge is not useful, right? I've got this visual representation of the waveform, copying, pasting, applying filters. It's very formal and doesn't take, it doesn't bring to bear all this knowledge that I have for my whole life of understanding physical objects. So what we made uh, was a tool that basically lets you <coughs> record a sound sample. There's a record button. This is an early prototype. Record button, microphone, so you can record your voice or dog barking, the wind, whatever you want. And then as soon as you're finished recording, this piezo sensor that's, that's um, coupled to the, the blade of this uh, palette knife becomes live. And it's the, the signal from the sensor, which is basically a very sensitive vibration sensor, uh, gets digitally convolved with the sound you recorded. And the effect of that convolution, uh, for those of you who have spent some time up at Karma, up on the hill, um, is basically a cross-filtering. So as I take this tool and brush it across different physical objects, physical textures, the character of those textures gets imparted on that sound that I recorded. So let me show you a video that it gives, may give you a little more of an idea. So what you're going to see first is me recording. I recorded a sound. And then I can use the textures. So that was a setup we had uh, last summer at the uh, SIGGRAPH Emerging Technologies uh, area. And so <clears throat> one of the themes that, that this work connects to uh, is there's this paper that I really like that uh, Bjorn Hartman and Scott Klemmer wrote uh, with Leila Takayama that, was, um, that talked about what they called thick practice, which was that you know, there are a lot of good things about physical objects that are not electronic that often don't make it into digital versions of the same thing. So a book, you can dog ear the pages, you can scribble in the margins. As soon as I start reading a PDF on my computer, I lose some of those capabilities that came from the physicality of the object. So I think that, that theme was inspirational as we made this project because what better way to, uh, to leverage this knowledge people have about the way physical objects sound and the way physical textures feel than to actually allow those objects and textures to participate in the process of doing digital audio manipulation. So it generalizes by using any material, leverages all this existing knowledge, and it's expressive too. I spent a lot of time at Karma when I was here building musical interfaces, and, uh, and subtle nuanced gesture uh, is important for expression. So the next project, uh, spend a few minutes on this. <clears throat> This project is, is more in, I would say, a ubiquitous computing, pervasive technology uh, exploration. And it comes from uh, the observation that there's a lot of information that would be helpful for us to have when we're out there in the physical world. So if I'm in a bookstore, wh what if I want reviews on these books to help me decide what to buy? Or if I'm in the supermarket, uh, there's a lot of extra information about all these products that might be helpful, health information, maybe knowing that my friends or family bought this product, that could help me decide whether I want it. Um, and some of this information is available when I'm sitting behind my laptop, behind my desktop computer, but it's often not easily accessible when I'm out there in the world. So approaches to <clears throat> this kind of problem in the past usually involve some kind of personal device, mobile device, like a cell phone, PDA. You know, there's, there's some, uh, some interesting work on uh, using PDAs or cell phones to scan barcodes and then immediately look up extra information about those products. Um, and so I, I knew about that work, but coming at it from an interaction point of view, uh, I was interested in how can you provide some of that same information that, that, that can be useful and personalized, but without 
forcing the person to be holding this PDA and looking at this little screen of it and then looking at the objects in the world. If I've got a, if I've got a cell phone in my hand, I can't use both of my hands to pick up something, look at it, turn it around. So my approach was to build some wearable devices. These are two of basically the same idea. Uh, on the left, it's a Bluetooth audio headset that has infrared communication facing forward uh, and a separate Bluetooth radio that allows it to have a wireless link to your cell phone or to a nearby computer. On the right is a ring that has the same capabilities. And then what I did is <clears throat> I made a series of these little beacons, little tokens that could be attached to objects. And uh, they have the same infrared communication capabilities, but they also have three visible light LEDs. So they can provide visual feedback as the person either looks at the shelf that has items on it or wearing the ring that I showed you, reaches towards a thing or points to it. Um, and so here's kind of a ring's eye view um, of what the supermarket shelves look like that I made to try this idea out. And what you're seeing is different colors show up when the ring points at different tags. So red indicates a conflict with the profile that's loaded. Green indicates it's OK. And then a blinking yellow indicates that there's a reason why the system thinks this item would be particularly of interest to the user. So I had a profile loaded in for that example that had an allergy to citrus and nuts. So when I pointed at the peanuts, it glowed red to show me, don't buy this. Uh, and so I had, a, I had some people use it, did a user study. Um, and I found that they actually did find items faster using this. This was like based on a grocery list type activity where they were looking for certain things. Um, you know, the, and, and then the, the qualitative feedback was more interesting. People reported that they actually felt comfortable integrating this kind of feedback on the world with their natural search strategies. That they would both look at the items, look at the ingredients, but also use this visual feedback as kind of a filter. You know, if it showed red, they don't even need to consider that item. <clears throat> so this presents an example of flexible, personalized information in our space. And that's the other side of what I'm, what I'm interested in when I say um, physical, physicality is important. Um, applying that to the to ubiquitous computing area, I think it's important for, for um, technology to integrate into the spaces that we inhabit and, and participate in those spaces better. Um, so this became a, a paper at Pervasive last year and a video in 2005 in Ubicomp. So coming back to this oversimplified diagram, um, as I mentioned, the basic idea here is the more meaning we encode in the physicality of an object, usually the less flexible it can be in terms of applying to a wide range of activities and being a tool that can be used for a wide range of activities. So I decided, well, I want to make I want to build a platform that, that may not be completely high and to the right on this diagram, but pushes in this direction of blending the things that are good about physicality with the things that are good about generalizability. So <clears throat> I call this idea embodied media. And uh, it's basically the idea that, uh, that a physical user interface that can give physical embodiment to collections of individual media items so that they can be manipulated by hand, so that more than one person can reach in and manipulate at the same time. Uh, and these, these tiles can respond to spatial arrangement, to their motion in each other, can provide some advantages for interacting with digital uh, information content. So I wanted to bring together, as I said, the physicality of having individual objects with the flexibility of graphics. Um, and thinking back to these problems like the Scrabble, uh, the, the cognitive science literature, the Scrabble, the Tetris, this ability for people to reach out and use their hands to move things around and rearrange a problem space, I think will, uh, will provide some advantages. So I built Siftables. This is in collaboration with my colleague from uh, MIT, Jeevan Kalanithi, who's also a Stanford grad. Um, and Siftables are an instantiation of this idea of embodied media. Uh, they're basically, each one is a little self-contained manipulative that has graphics, that can sense the presence of its neighbors, that can sense its motion, and that can communicate wirelessly with a computer. So a little bit about the design process. Um, I was interested in this class of problems that can be mapped to ordering or spatially configuring different content items. So think about things like uh, creating a slideshow with your photos on a computer, editing video clips together, 
arranging guests at a party where certain people need to sit with certain people, some people shouldn't sit with other people. And so my hypothesis was that this kind of an interface, this embodied media interface, would have some advantages for these types of problems by allowing people to rearrange the problem space quickly. Uh, so I built a quick prototype. This was totally non-electronic, just wood, acrylic, paper, playing around with the size the manipulative should be and helping us think about what kind of activities they might support. Um, you know, it turns out they need to be big enough so you can see images on them. If you're going to show photos and have people sort their photos, uh, they can't be too small. As they, as they approach the size of a cell phone, it gets inconvenient to have a lot of them on the table. So there was kind of a sweet spot on what size these manipulatives wanted to be. And then we built the first working prototype, uh, which is pretty rudimentary, but allowed us to start playing with things like uh, how to display the graphics, how to have these, ob these uh, manipulatives react to each other. What you're seeing here is they're showing uh, a triangle just to indicate that, they, uh, that each one knows it has a neighbor. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about these uh, capabilities in a minute. And then we iterated on the design, made a much more robust case, um, <clears throat> improved the firmware, the uh, API for programming Siftables. And what that allowed us to do was to <clears throat> get a community of people involved in developing on this platform. So um, fortunately, uh, at the Media Lab, we have this relatively large sponsor community. And a lot of these companies have R&D teams that were interested to play with Siftables and implement their own ideas on the platform. So created a wiki to just disseminate information and, uh, and code for doing that. Built some applications that I'm going to tell you more about in a minute. And then evaluated uh, a couple of those applications with users. So I'm going to now spend the rest of the talk specifically on Siftables, taking you through the platform, the applications, and what we learned about it. This is a video of some short interaction sketches that just give you an idea of the kinds of manipulations that Siftables are well suited for. So some of them are inspired by physical world things that we do, like shaking a liquid to mix it up. It might become shaking a picture to blur it more and more. <clears throat> In this case, tilting one direction rolls the video one way. Tilting the other direction rolls the video backwards. Uh, pouring liquids is something that we do in, in our physical lives, too. Why not pour a color from one to the other if you're implementing a Photoshop-like application? This is more of a playful <laughs> application. This actually came from an uh, <coughs> installation art piece that we have on the wall of our lab that's kind of a Brady Bunch-style uh, collection of monitors. with Each, each has an interactive portrait on it. Um, but the, the Siftables version of it was fun because it allowed the, the portraits to be rearranged and they can respond to shaking and gravity and things like that too. And that's just showing how quickly they, <coughs> they recognize the other. Having inertial sensing built in, like the Wii controller, uh, allows them to respond to the surface that they're on. So if the surface gets bumped, that can be a meaningful input for, uh, for an application. Organizing content is something that we do, creating sequences, slideshows on the computer. Um, you know, Siftables could be used uh, as a physical system to build such a slideshow. And then finally, in the next clip, uh, labeling content, uh, putting files into folders, adding tags to our photos, something we do both in physical and virtual, or physical and digital lives. Uh, this shows an example of how you might just bump up, bump the object against its neighbors to add a, a given tag to those content items. So those are a bunch of sketches. Those are not complete applications. Um, but it sets the stage uh, to, to talk about what Siftables are and what they can do. So they can display color graphics, which gives us this flexibility that I talked about. Right, Pixels are easy to change. They can sense their physical motion, uh, three-axis accelerometer. They sense their neighbors in close proximity. And they communicate wirelessly with the computer. So I designed these to support diverse problem representations that would take advantage of distributed cognition, take advantage of our physical abilities to reach out, grasp, <clears throat> and move things around. Here's a picture of the guts for anyone who's interested. Uh, so basically an Atmel AVR microcontroller, two microcontrollers, flash memory, organic LED display, rechargeable battery, Bluetooth radio, three-axis accelerometer, and uh, four infrared modules for communication in the, in the four directions. 
and we made a ton of them. <laughs> we made 140, which, well, to me seems like a ton of them. Um, and uh, here's another view. Uh, this is, I think, only about 90 of the complete set. And uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of basic event-oriented uh, operating system that, that I wrote for these, uh, handling shake. So siftable gets shaken. We've got this three-axis accelerometer. The data comes in, and you see this wiggle on the accelerometer data. Each siftable is continually running this uh, variance, a windowed variance computation that basically tells us how much energy, how much motion energy is happening on each of the three axes. And so when that variance crosses the threshold, uh, the event gets triggered, can either get handled on the siftable in the firmware, or it can be broadcast wirelessly back to the computer. Uh, like you saw in the, <coughs> in the earlier video, it could be used to implement this shake to blur interaction. Infrared communication is how they communicate to each other in all four directions. So it goes round robin. It tries every two milliseconds to talk to its neighbor on a new side. If there's no neighbor there, it moves on. If there is a neighbor there, it broadcasts its ID and which side it's transmitting from. And I deliberately tuned this communication to be very short range. Given the context of use that you'd have a collection of siftables out on a table, um, if siftable A can detect siftable B, meter away on the tabletop, it's not, as, it's not a useful signal of proximity as it would be uh, when they're next to each other. Um, and this also points out uh, a trade-off, right? Because you, you're probably aware of uh, multi-touch table, tabletop computing type interfaces. The nice thing about those interfaces is that you have absolute position. You know where two objects are. You know where two fingertips are. Whereas these guys, relying less on infrastructure, like a special sensing surface or camera looking down from the top or the bottom, uh, they don't know absolutely where they are, but they know when they're near a neighbor. And so it turned out that a dedicated processor was useful to implement this, uh, this neighbor sensing behavior just because it was pretty timing sensitive. <clears throat> so here's a video showing a bunch of siftables recognizing each other when they get next to each other. It's pretty fast. Um, having spent a lot of time at, at Karma doing computer music interfaces, I wanted this to be zippy enough that you could actually you could make a music interface with it if you wanted to. Um, so another hardware feature that I thought would be interesting to mention because of its UI implications was the OLED screen. And <clears throat> if you've looked at an LCD screen, most laptops have these, off-axis, at least the older ones, you, you start to lose the ability to see the screen as you get further and further from looking directly at, uh, dead on at it. And so it turns out that organic LED displays don't have this problem at all. You can look at siftable screens or any OLED screen at an extremely glancing angle, and it maintains its ability for you to see the picture, which is important given the context of use where you might have many of these out on the table, people looking at them from different angles on both sides of the table. Um, it would, it would hamper the interactivity if you couldn't see what was being displayed on the surface. The other implication of an OLED screen is that each pixel actually draws its own energy relatively independent of the others. So if you have, uh, so the image that you're displaying on the siftable or how you're using that screen can make a big impact on the, the uh, battery life, right? So if I, if I show a white image, full power, all pixels on, that's going to take a lot more energy than an image that has darker spots in it. So how do you program a distributed system? <clears throat> right, Siftables is, is a distributed system. One way to think of it is like a kind of a sensor network mashed up with a tangible user interface. Uh, and so one way to do it is distributed code and algorithms, right? Each node could have its own code that operates without any global awareness of what's happening on the other ones. And uh, the advantage of, of programming in a distributed way is that it can be extremely robust, right? I mean, thinking back to early uh, um, distributed, distributed system implementations. Uh, one node goes down, it doesn't take the whole system down. You can also get an interesting immersion behavior. You know, think of John Conway's uh, Game of Life. Uh, it's not easy to predict what happens when a lot of little nodes are interacting with each other independently. But <clears throat> it can be difficult to author complex interactions, which when you're designing for HCI, you typically want to control exactly what's going to happen. So, there are some limitations. The other side, the other possibility, of course, is centralized control, where you have a, a program on the computer dictating 
what all Siftables are doing and hearing back from them. Uh, it's easier to author with centralized control, with one node of control, uh, but it can be brittle because if communication with that one node goes down, the whole thing breaks. So what I ended up with was a bit of both. Um, as I said, there's this minimal operating system on Siftables that, that does things like pulling the hardware, uh, sampling the accelerometer, talking over the infrared to neighbors if there are any neighbors there. But it brings it up into this higher level um, event-driven API. And you can write a program that lives in the firmware on the Siftable if you want to write a completely dis uh, distributed program where each Siftable has its own behavior. Um, on the other hand, uh, I developed a Python API so that from a computer you can make a connection from a Python program to a group of Siftables and uh, control them as a, as a group. So it turns out that for, for quick prototyping of ideas, it's easier to use the Python uh, implementation because you don't have to reprogram every device. Um, but you have this infrastructure requirement of having a, a computer there to run the, the program. Here's just an example of what it looks like to write an event handler in the firmware on the Siftable. Basically, if you want it to respond to, to an event like tilt or shake or whatever, you would write a function that you want to get called when that event happens and then register it. Uh, passing it as a function pointer, and it'll get called whenever the Siftable gets shaken or tilted or whatnot. Uh, in Python, this is just six lines of code showing <coughs> importing the library, setting up a connection to a Siftable, um, creating a handler to handle a tilt event, installing the handler, turning the tilt events on. So in about six lines of code, you have uh, a wireless connection to this physical device that can report back when it gets tilted or shaken. So let's have a look at the events I implemented. Um, the, the events that can be subscribed to, either in the firmware or, on, or in Python, are shaking. Uh, it tells you when it starts getting shaken. tells you when it, the shaking stops. Uh, tilt on x or y axis. When neighbors arrive or depart. Those are like the single siftable events. But then there's this class of um, compound events. So two, two of these manipulatives get put next to each other. Uh, a recognizes that it's now next to B. B recognizes that it's now next to A, and they both report back over the Bluetooth to say, hey, I have a new neighbor. So um, there's some coalescing that gets done to basically turn those two events into a single topology change event. And then free gesture, of course, with the uh, accelerometer being sampled at 100 hertz, you can capture up signals up to 50 hertz, which is pretty good for any human scale uh, motion of these devices. So that adds some flexibility too. Uh, a little bit more of an explanation of compound events. Say you were <coughs> decided to implement a social network application where you mapped some of the friends in your social network, each, each one to a siftable, and you wanted to introduce two people to each other uh, with a tangible interface. Um, one way to do that could be just put the objects next to each other. But um, I don't think Facebook supports this, but if you wanted to say, uh, indicate the strength of the connection between those two people. Like, I think these two are going to be really good friends. Let me recommend them you know, to, to friend each other really quickly. Then I might tilt these towards each other to a certain level. Right? So it can be this collection of two events, where first you get a proximity event. These guys came together. Then you get a tilting that you could read off continuously. Um, creating a sequence is the same thing uh, for the reason I just mentioned, this coalescing of the, of the two events. So there's a pretty wide range of gesture language possibilities that comes out of a platform like this. And one of the ones I think is the most important is that they're not confined to the two-dimensional plane of interaction anymore. Right? Like multi-touch is really great, but it has to exist in this two-dimensional plane of the surface. So when you free these manipulatives from the surface by giving them their own built-in sensing capabilities, uh, you can come away and do three-dimensional three spatial gestures. Uh, the, the kind of tilting that you saw in the video, pouring a color, uh, two events, uh, one after another. Um, sensing the surface that they're on, right? So impacts to the surface that can be set to uh, <coughs> register when, when they get shaken, and that sensitivity can be tuned. Uh, pushing them together into a pile could be a gesture of creating a, a grouping, right? Say I've, Got siftles representing my files. Push them into a pile to create, uh, to put them in a folder together. Um, interactions with other objects. 
So you know, if I made a music sequencer, I might set the volume of the overall mix with a tilt. You know, so leaving these leaned up against a wedge could be a quick way to set the, set the volume and then adjust it quickly. And then finally, other things like shaking. You, know, you could have a yes, no, shaking one way or another to confirm, snapping it. There's a lot of possibilities. But so since, uh, since you're a computer science audience, you might, you might be wondering, well, isn't there a problem here? Don't we lose <coughs> something by making, your, making digital items physical? Right? If I've got an individual siftable representing each of my photos, I'm going to run out of siftables pretty quickly. Right? I'm always going to have more files, more photos, more video clips than I could ever possibly have siftables on my desktop. And that's a good question. And that problem uh, is one that everybody who makes a physically embodied user interface thinks about. Right? Because like I said in the beginning, there are just certain, there are certain features that graphical user interfaces have in terms of flexibility that's hard to replicate. But I would say that the introduction of the screen, the introduction of different gestures can offer one, one possible solution to this problem. So say we're pushing a group of, of siftables into a pile to group those files into a folder on my computer. I could then do a gesture that's mapped to, OK, now take that group, make it now represented by a single device. Right? So, so that group of files now gets represented by this siftable. And the fact that I've got a screen on it allows it to show that to the user. Right? Either it can show uh, smaller icons of each file or some kind of summary indicator that, that now this is not one to one, but now this is many to one. And in a similar way, you could unpack and push a group from one siftable out back onto a collection. So this would allow the, the ones that aren't being used anymore to get re repopulated with other pieces of content. And it <clears throat> reminds me of this really appropriate quote, which I think is great. Paul Durish said, tangible computing is of interest because it's uh, not purely physical. Right? It's a physical realization of a symbolic reality. So it's this blend, it's this hybrid. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities that we still have yet to explore. So putting together this space of possible gestures, this space of different topologies you can make in two dimensions, I think there's a, uh, a class of activity types that are particularly well uh, supported by this type of interface. One is multi-person information-centric collaboration around collections of, of digital content items. Um, you know, having, having physical manipulatives, one of, the, one of the nice implications is that it's easy for multiple people to reach in and, and manipulate um, a problem together. Anywhere, tabletop and 3D interaction. So it comes away from the two-dimensional surface. Doesn't need a special architecture, a special sensing infrastructure to be built into the surface in order to work. Two-handed, all-finger, bodily interaction, re-engaging the body, and then offloading the working memory. Right? So like those cognitive science experiments I showed, um, we can th objects help us think. And then overall, at a high level, I think we can reduce the time and cost of exploring a solution space by giving people this easy ability to rearrange, uh, rearrange the problem. So I want to look at a little related work and distinguish what I've done from what's already out there. Um, tangible user interfaces, uh, pioneered by uh, people like Hiroshi Ishii, who was here earlier this year, uh, and, and several others. Um, building basically physical ways to interact with computers that are not the mouse and keyboard. And so with tangible interfaces, uh, Siftable shares this interest in physicality, but again, it's trying to be a little more general than many of them by, by allowing for this graphical display on each manipulative. Ubiquitous computing, pervasive computing, has long been interested in how uh, technology can follow us out into our lives and follow us away from the desktop and provide useful information when we're at a place that's not the office, right? So I think mobile phones are probably the greatest, the most popular example of ubiquitous technology today. Um, and so whereas Siftables shares this interest in allowing technology to work in our spaces more seamlessly, uh, it's more about manipulating the information than just providing the information. Gestural uh, user interfaces, going all the way back to early uh, stylus, uh, the sketchpad interface by Sutherland in 63. Of, 
course, Doug Engelbart's first mouse, um, to more modern ones, up to and including the Nintendo Wii. Uh, there's, it's very powerful to be able to, to do spatial, uh, expressive gesture with technology. Um, so Siftable shares this ability to sense gesture, but is also looking at multiple manipulatives and uh, feedback on the tools themselves. A couple more. The tabletop, you know, from, from pucks on a surface style tabletop interfaces, like the React table or Sense table, to multi-touch, like Jeff Hahn or, or the iPhone, or ones like Microsoft Surface that put these two together. Um, they offer a lot of possibilities. They offer some physicality, but again, these are all, they're all stuck in the two-dimensional plane of interaction of the table itself. So Siftables comes away from that by being less reliant on the infrastructure that these systems have. And then finally, sensor networks. I mentioned that one way I think about this platform and other platforms that could be built like it is that it's a mashup between a sensor network and a tangible user interface. Um, but whereas sensor networks are mostly used in monitoring scenarios, like monitoring the strains <clears throat> and stresses on a bridge, or monitoring the moisture in different parts of a garden, um, I'm interested in taking some of this design philosophy for a distributed system and then building a user interface out of it. So that's kind of what Siftables are. So I'm going to show you now some uh, applications. Uh, not a complete set, but uh, just a few highlights. <clears throat> and uh, roughly breaking down into a few categories, educational, gaming, infrastructure, and then image manipulation app that I made for my thesis. So this is one that my uh, office mate has been working on, roughly based on a Dr. Seuss book called Hop on Pop. It's an app for kids mice on mice. to teach uh, basic sentence construction. Mice on ice. And so what you're seeing is you spell the sentence with the lower three, and then you hear the result, and you see a picture on the top one that shows the kid a graph. House on mouse. There's a house sitting on top of a mouse. Mouse on house. Mouse on house. Mouse on top of the house. So this is one of three education-related applications that my colleague Seth Hunter is making. Um, and, uh, and so the next steps is that <clears throat> he's going to be bringing this to an elementary school to test it out with kids. And um, you, you know, as I said, basic sentence construction, a little bit of punctuation, capitalizing the first letter of a sentence, period at the end. Uh, one of his other apps is for pre-literate children, so it's e relying even less on their understanding of written language. Uh, attentionables, you saw this in the video that I showed. Uh, basically, uh, an interactive art piece that's kind of fun. Here is um, an app called Maze Explorer, which is basically uh, you have this character represented by this dot. You're exploring a larger terrain, and you can dump your character from one tile to the other by tilting it towards the next guy. <clears throat> And then by shaking, you get an overview mode. shows you where you've explored already. Shake it again. Go back to uh, normal game mode. <clears throat> so I think this is an interesting example of um, both using small screens to explore larger terrain, but also of mapping a gesture to a specific meaning in the application. Right? That's, there's, there's always this problem when we have a new platform that has some new capabilities of, well, how do we connect the capabilities of the platform to to what the application needs are. So this is kind of inspired by physics, this gesture of dumping an object from, from one thing to another. This one is the one you saw, Scrabago. It's a word finding game. This was kids from a summer program that came by the Media Lab a few months ago. And so you can hear they're all shouting out, suggesting which words can be built. We pointing at things. <laughs> me. Oh, you already did me. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's me getting high fived. Um, <clears throat> so one interesting thing about this is that I never have to explain this application to anybody. I just say, make words, and each each tile shows a letter. People just start moving them around. It's very natural. So, you know, there's this great interest in um, in HCI for so-called walk-up and use interfaces, kiosk interfaces, things like that. Um, I think that for for manipulatives to be self-describing in a way, like also thinking back to um, the first one I showed, the educational application. Uh, I don't know if you caught it, but 
the very first thing that happened was you got a little uh, video on the fourth siftable that showed two fingers coming down and rearranging siftables. So you can actually show some, some instructions on the screens of the devices themselves. Um, another interesting thing for this application was I noticed uh, with some people the strategy of just mashing the tiles together to try to find words. It's almost like a random search by just pushing as many things together as they could and uh, the system takes care of figuring out when a valid word has been spelled. Um, <clears throat> so a couple of more like infrastructure uh, applications or libraries that I made. I got interested in the kinds of topologies that could be created with an interface like this. What kind of connectivity structures I could make. And uh, so I built uh, a basic graph library that, let, that has nodes and edges and you can create connections between two nodes by just bumping them up against each other. And uh, you could see what, what happens is you get visual feedback on the screen when two nodes are connected. And this is a response to this challenge. Like I said before, there are certain things that tabletop interfaces are good at, such as drawing lines between nodes when you have a graph type representation of a problem. And so this is one idea of how that, uh, how that problem could be mitigated, right? I can't draw graphics between the siftables because each one is self-contained and I don't have a projector. But by putting color-coded feedback uh, on the screens, it's one way to allow people to still understand the connectivity of the graph. And also thinking towards simulation scenarios where you might be doing modeling of a, of a problem, uh, I put the ability to set a continuous level on the siftable by tilting it back and forth. So say you're adjusting a rate and then setting up the connectivity of, of items in a production model. <clears throat> this is a very basic position estimation uh, library that we're working on, just doing some integration on the accelerometer data to track the position across the tabletop. Again, looking at some of the things that, uh, that are more challenging with a distributed interface like this, uh, absolute position is hard to get. But this kind of library could, could start to bridge that gap. Made this developer wiki to disseminate information to, uh, to like I said, the developers that are out there working on apps. Um, just basically how to, known bugs, things like that. I uh, had about 29 users on it. And, uh, there's a bunch of development kits that are out there in various, uh, being used in various ways. Jeevan Kalanithi, my collaborator at the, at the lab, had been working with Panasonic for a while, helping them on some application ideas that they're interested in. Um, here at Stanford, uh, Bjorn got a couple of them, and he was playing around with using them as dynamic labels for an experiment uh, they were doing uh, to expose internal uh, variables inside of programs. Um, and then a bunch of sponsors at the lab, the Media Lab, as I mentioned, have gotten development kits to work with uh, on their own projects. And then I've gotten a, a bunch more emails from just miscellaneous uh, people out there on the internet that have seen it. So there's a lot of interest in this kind of a, a platform. And so what I'm going to do now is show you <clears throat> a couple of experiments that I ran. This was a setup for the first experiment. It was just, I wanted to get a baseline and just understand the efficiency characteristics of siftables for activities that involved rearranging, um, ordering tasks or grouping tasks. So uh, in this case, we had either um, numbers displayed on the siftables, and people would rearrange based putting the, the objects in numeric order. Uh, or they'd get colors on them, and they'd have to group them into two groups. Uh, or letters, so they'd have to alphabetize. And I, I pitted, in some cases, it was only one person. In some cases, it was two people working together. So that was one con uh, one difference and then mouse versus siftables. So I made a similar application on the computer where they were dragging icons around with the mouse. And the summary was that <coughs> siftables are faster, maybe not surprising. It's easier, it's faster to reach out and move things around with your hands and to use the mouse cursor. Um, but also it was, it was faster for two people to work together than for one. And that was interesting for me to see um, because that was that was what I thought in the beginning is that this kind of interface allows for more than one person to work with content and there's an efficiency advantage but it was nice to see that uh, in the data and uh, and then finally maybe also not surprising the using the mouse it, it wasn't significantly more uh, more advantageous for two people to work with it than one it's hard for two people to use a mouse at the same time at the same time so usually it, w it would be one person using it the other person pointing at the screen so the other uh, study that I ran was for an image manipulation task where basically uh, people would get 
uh, two images. One on the left had been had some effects applied to it, like blur, hue, saturation. And then the one on the right was the image they were working on. And so they had one siftable, which was like the starting point, and they could create sequences of effects by putting these other siftables to the right of it into an ordering. Um, so that would create the sequence of effects. They would get applied in order. They'd see the result on the, on the larger screen. And then they could also adjust the magnitude of the effects by tilting the siftable one way or the other. So here, this one, this video shows what it looked like when they were tilting. They get a little preview on the screen of the effect being adjusted. Right? And then after it was uh, not being tilted for a while, it would go back to just showing the label. Excuse me. Um, so here's what I found. First, the bad news. Um, the mouse was preferred for parameter adjusting. That interaction you just saw with tilt to adjust, it was kind of slow. Um, people said, well, I'm so used to using the mouse that it's just faster for me to, uh, to click and drag. In the graphical user interface version of this activity, it was basically the same thing but fully on screen. And they could rearrange the effects. And then there was a slider at the bottom. Um, so you know, that's probably not surprising. And also, overall time on task was longer for using siftables. Um, and then people said, well, it was easier for me to learn the, the version using the mouse also. Again, looking at the qualitative feedback, people reported they had a lot of experience using the mouse. So, uh, so it was easier for them to learn. It's more efficient, and they felt more in control. The tilt to adjust, sometimes they'd overshoot. But when I asked them about the effect ordering and experimenting with different effects, people said, well, siftables were better for that. So for um, exploring the effect order, for quick, uh, quick sequencing, they preferred siftables uh, because it allowed them to, to move, more fat, move more quickly and try different possibilities more easily. <clears throat> and then for final sequencing, it still suggests that they like siftables better, not as strong of a result. I asked them both for, like quick versus final. What would you want to use out there in a real application? And then looking at some other features, uh, people said it was, they felt that it was more enjoyable to use siftables, uh, more expressive, and then also they felt that um, it was better for domain learning. In this case, learning about image manipulation and different operators and what the effects of putting you know, saturation and then blur versus blur than saturation or thresholding and then blur. Uh, you know, for some certain combinations of effects, the order actually made a big difference. And so people felt like they learned more about the activity using siftables. So <clears throat> looking forward, I think there's some interesting directions for this platform and, and other systems like it. I'm interested to push farther on the core technology itself. Um, I mentioned earlier that I feel like, in some ways, this is a sensor network and a tangible interface mashed up. And at the moment, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of minimally a sensor network. right? Each one has a Bluetooth radio, so you can do star topology where they're all talking to one point of control. But I think it would be interesting to push further in the direction of mesh networking, right? Put radios like Zigbee radios on here that are very good at doing peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication and see what happens, you know, and add some other uh, capabilities like localization, right? There's a lot of good work in sensor networks on how nodes can figure out where they are with respect to each other using uh, things like time of flight for audio versus radio, things like that. So I think it'd be fun to, to incorporate more of, of the technologies from sensor networks into this platform and see what kind of UI advantages come out of of those additions. Also, mobility <coughs> and spatial gesture were two elements that were part of the thought process, but I didn't get to test that much in the current implementation. Um, you know, like I said, in contrast to a, a, a tabletop interface, siftables can be picked up. You can take them somewhere else. But I think it would be interesting to, to really do more ethnography about how would people use this if they really could put it in their pocket, take it somewhere else, take it to a coffee shop, open it up, work with their data. Um, and then also the spatial gesture, right? Uh, <clears throat> how they can be used in three dimensions, I think, would be interesting to do a lot more with. In terms of application areas, um, I've heard a lot of feedback about educational possibilities. You know, imagine if you had uh, a math simulator for kids where each of these had either a number or a symbol, and you could put them into different orderings to create equations. And it would either say, OK, now I've got, you know, a Part of an equation, you have to find the right number that completes the equation. Or I've got part of an equation, put the blank one down, and it'll show you what the number is. There's a lot of possibilities there. Uh, or for entertainment, you know, for gaming, uh, bringing the action off of the large single screen 
down into the player space. You know, imagine if you're playing a, a you know, role-playing game on the computer and I can actually take my uh, SIFTL representing my possessions and give some of them to my fellow gamer you know, as a side channel. It could open up some interesting possibilities. And then also for tools for scientists and other professionals I think would be really interesting. Um, I asked a, um, a, a friend who's a researcher at the Santa Fe Institute who had a chance to interact with SIFTables for a while what she thought. And she said, every ep epidemiologist I know uses a paper and pencil to think about these ideas. An interactive physical interface would be great. So often you want to quickly try moving an equation uh, or parameter around a bit and you have to start all over again. So to think about models like an epidemiology model where there's a lot of different possible inputs, a lot of different strengths on the inputs, there can be a big benefit to be able to try things quickly and, um, and understand how that impacts the model. Uh, and then another researcher at the Edgerton Center at MIT who does a lot of curriculum development said it would be really interesting to use siftables to model protein cascades. It would be cool to be able to take one of them out and see what would happen to the rest of the tree. Would it affect certain branches or parts of the cascade? So I feel like I'm at the beginning. There's a lot more that I want to do. Uh, zooming out a bit <coughs> back to embodied media, which as I mentioned, this idea of physical manipulatives that can each represent content items. I think that we can empower uh, information-centric problem-solving activities across a lot of different domains, from science to education, uh, gaming. Uh, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. The technology advances are going to create interesting opportunities to have a lot more devices to manage them easily. So things like uh, display chemistry, you know, you've probably seen the e-ink display on the, the Amazon Kindle reader, visible in sunlight, be interesting to, to you know, in, in, in the spirit of getting them out there into places where people are that are away from their desk, I think something like that could be good. Um, battery energy density is still one of the main problems on mobile devices, but getting better little by little. Uh, or finally, I mean, looking really far forward, technology is like a programmable matter, where <clears throat> at some point, I think we are going to have uh, this ability to have just a kind of an amorphous goop that can change its shape, can display different, uh, different graphics on its surface, and just think about what kinds of physical user interfaces you can make when it's completely physical, but also completely malleable. I think that's just going to be amazing. Uh, so the next generation, then, of tools for interacting with the information world, I think will be more expressive, physically embodied uh, to, to a great degree, flexible, and mobile. So uh, that's all. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. In terms of exploring the design space, uh, could you could you compare uh, Siftables with Cube World and Cube World? Yeah. And and you know maybe maybe some some dimensions. And Cube World is, is very it's a single application platform. Right. Platform under there. And it uses personification, uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's a desktop stack sort of thing, based on ambient. I mean, in terms of dimensions of, of some kind of space that, that they place their device in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you who haven't seen it, Cube World is this uh, <clears throat> toy that consists of these colorful cubes that each have a, a grayscale screen on the front, and what you can do is each one has uh, a little cartoon character of a, of a guy in each one and then you put them next to each other and they'll interact. So maybe you know, put, put A next to B, the guy from A will walk over into B and they'll fight or put, put B on top of A and the guy on top will throw a rope down and the other guy will climb back up. So they're, yeah, yeah. So there's, all, there's a lot of different animations and it can depend on which one you put next to which one. There are different, different personalities I think. Um, I think that's interesting that the, the vector that they're exploring really deeply is what do you get by having separate, man, separate uh, objects that can react to each other when you put them and that can be aware of each other. Um, so, it, you know, Cube World is fun. It's a single application platform. It'd be interesting if Cube World was more of an open platform. You know, I'd like, in the same way that I saw all this interest, people emailing me about how can I get Siftables because I want to make application X, Y, or Z. It'd be interesting to see Cube World open their open their platform up and have other people be able to develop content for it. Um, so I guess to answer your question, yeah, it, Cube World's interesting. It, it does kind of a subset of what Siftables do um, towards a specific application. So you know that's not to say that 
in the future, Siftables could could be, or, or an interface like it, could be uh, uh, kind of purposed into a number of different single-use cases like that for different, you know, for education or entertainment or whatnot. Yeah, I don't think it's here, but yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, 10 bucks retail a note as well. Yeah, no, it's very cheap. They really. Yeah, I, I'm inspired by how cheaply they make it. You know, these are in prototype quantities, like an order of magnitude more expensive than that. Um, so it's interesting to see that they've done that. Yeah. Uh huh. Talk a little bit about emergent phenomena. Have yeah. you ever been able to collaborate with Resnick on Star Logo and? I haven't. Although I've talked with, I've talked with Mitchell and some of his students. Um, one of his students uh, was interested in building a tangible programming language with Siftables. Not necessarily just taking the, you know, they have this scratch environment where you can basically put pieces of a program together graphically, um, which is great because it, you, can, you can't make bad syntax with it. Um, so he, he this, this student Eric has been working on that. He was actually interested in um, making a tangible programming language <clears throat> that, that would break from the tradition of most examples of that, where if you look at the, the literature on physical programming languages, usually you have a single uh, object for each statement of the program. So if you're going to make a really big program, you're going to need a lot of objects and line them all up. Um, so what Eric wanted to do was to change that a little bit and make one of these represent the program itself or the vessel for statements. And then he'd go around and kind of like that labeling example that you saw, he'd go around and bump it up against other other Siftables that each represented a statement in the program to make to, to write the program statement by statement. And then you'd see visual representation growing on the screen as it got longer and longer. Uh, and then a gesture like maybe shake it becomes a subroutine that then can be embedded into larger programs. Um, physical primitive? What do you mean by that? Well, in the sense that it would be a mini program and it's good. Right, right. Yeah, so each of these could be, could represent either a single statement or a subroutine, basically. Yeah, and then they could be embedded into larger programs. Other questions? Comments? Yeah. Is that on the practical aspect of this, do you envision that people would have dozens and dozens of them in their little briefcase to, to work with them? <laughs> I think that would be great. Um, I mean, as, as was pointed out, there's an expense to having physical objects. Uh, you know, at this point, particularly since there's, there's a lot of capabilities packed into each one. Um, I think that for, for a number of activities, it would be great to have a lot of them, you know. And, uh, and the luxury of being a researcher is that I can, it, it's okay if they're expensive and I can have a lot of them. Um, to, reach, uh, to reach a mass audience, then they would need to become a lot cheaper. But I think that if they could be made cheaply enough, then having 25 of them would be great. You know, say you're organizing your photographs, the latest batch from your camera, to be able to just look at the set of them, pull the ones together that you want to group into a folder or, or put into a, you know, an online album together would be nice. But I think with any number, it's never going to be enough. So there's also an interesting design challenge there, which is the system needs to be able to prioritize which content items need to be on the siftables at any moment and which don't. You know, which are part of the activity right now and which can fade into the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How yeah, well suited siftables can be to like multi-user collaboration together. Uh -huh. Have you seen any like, interesting surprises as you've seen people work with them in a group set? Interesting surprises. Um, <clears throat> the two settings that I've had multiple people using them are one for that study I did where people were sorting them together. Um, so I don't know if this isn't really surprising maybe, but uh, you know, I saw in some cases both people would get their hands in there and reach in and be moving them around. Uh, it, and sometimes they, they would get in each other's way, right? If both people are trying to reach towards the same one or somebody's got their arms here and then this person needs to reach across and grab one over here. Um, <clears throat> when I was watching them, I actually wasn't sure that it was going to be faster for more than one person to use siftables together just because I did see people getting in each other's way. Um, so I guess it was a little bit surprising to me after watching people that, yes, the data actually did show that it was faster. Um, and then the other, the other multi-person scenarios have been with that word finding application. Um, and I wouldn't say there's anything surprising 
that I saw. I mean, people people do collaborate. They're both reaching in. Um, you know, people don't always use both hands. In the, in the the one I just mentioned with the content organization, sometimes I would see one person using both hands and the other person just reaching in with a single hand. So you know, not surprising, but uh, interesting to, to, to just watch how people use it. Okay. Well, you're dismissed. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.